Welcome to FedScoop TV. I'm Wyatt Cash, and we're here at the 8th Annual Lowering the Cost of Government IT Forum. And today I'm with Ann Duncan, uh, CIO of the EPA. And thanks so much for joining us. Glad to be here, Wyatt. So I um, wanted to chat a couple uh, areas. One is the cloud. We've seen cloud, uh, we're five years into generally trying to implement it. We've seen the promise of a lot of savings. Um, Tell us a little about how you see um, where we are in the curve of mm -hmm. some of those savings and efficiencies, and is there more opportunity for additional savings to ring out from what cloud offers? So I think most agencies are still pretty early in that process. If I look across my portfolio of investments at EPA, we have a relatively small percentage that are truly in the cloud mm -hmm. and are truly built as cloud native applications that can take full advantage of the cost savings we can achieve in the cloud. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for more savings and you know, we're, per we're pursuing multiple paths to get there. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Well, and that kind of relates to a second topic of modernizing legacy systems. And, you know, it, it seems like we're in this catch-22. You need a, some initial investment to be able to get off the legacy and into more modern systems. But um, uh, I guess, could you describe a little on what kind of progress you're making at EPA on moving away from or uh, transitioning mm -hmm. from legacy systems? And are you seeing any savings so far that you can uh, go back to management and say, this is definitely paying off? Yeah, the, the savings question is a really tough one because uh, you know we start a project and, and you reach an agreement with someone that, yeah, we're going to save a bunch of money. And then by the time you get to the project, somehow uh, that savings is a little harder to quantify because mm -hmm. people are worried about their budgets disappearing. So I think as a, as a government, again, we have a lot of work to do to be able to truly quantify some of these savings. Um, but definitely we're seeing as we come the other side, and it takes a lot of time for these modernization projects in some cases, uh, that we're really seeing some, some savings in terms of the way things operate, um, the cost of operating those systems, and more importantly, the cost of modernizing them the next time, because we're not creating big monolithic uh, systems that can't be easily modernized, but we're creating modular systems where you can take a piece out and replace it when you need to. So we have focused more on building new things in modern ways and very slowly moving some of our old things. Right now we're doing things like removing customizations from some of our solutions mm -hmm. and getting ready to move some of those. Um, so we're starting to see some small benefits, but we really are seeing big benefits on the things that we've started in the cloud and been cloud native and use modern development and agile practices from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think sometimes the argument around savings is short-sighted. I mean, there's the urgency of older systems just really running out of their life cycle. Mm -hmm. And then there's the new value that you can add to the mission that is sometimes hard to articulate. Uh, it's different than savings, but mm -hmm. it is a kind of a, a form of return on investment. So are, are you seeing some progress either in terms of um, uh, reducing the risk of aging mm -hmm. systems that really become a mm -hmm. potential hazard? or uh, new value that you've been able to offer uh, both your employees and uh, all the people that are part of the EPA ecosystem. Right, and that's definitely true. We see, I mean, there's no doubt we save money. It's often hard to quantify, as I said, but we, the biggest advantage for us in these systems is really the ability to deliver new capability to people really quickly, and we're delivering services that reduce burden on the public mm -hmm. very fast uh, in some cases. In just a few months, we can take a system, we can automate a process that was previously manual, or we can simplify a process that was previously very complex and see real savings and benefits to the regulated community and to the general public. And that's, that's a pretty huge uh, savings that we see on, on a regular basis from these. We also are able to, as you said, get rid of some of those things that are obsolete, which create risk in terms of systems being unsupported from a security mm -hmm. standpoint and also from an operational standpoint of, you know, as soon as I upgrade the operating system on the desktops, this system's going to be obsolete. I've got to get rid of it, right? So I got to move that, move fast, get rid of that system so that I can then focus on uh, making sure my staff has the best productivity tools that aren't hobbled by a system that can't go to Windows 10, for example. Right. Talk to me just briefly about FATARA, which is the uh, Acquisition Reform Act for around IT. Has it helped? Oh, FATARA has helped immensely, right? It's helped us bring people to the table that weren't in the conversation before about how to work together across the agency for IT. Mm -hmm. So we, we have, you know, we certainly could treat FATARA, as I've said before, as a big stick that we can use to beat people over their head and make them come to us. But we really have treated it like a carrot. Here's an opportunity for us all to work together. And our agency has been incredibly cooperative in that process. People have come to the table and we've empowered not only me and my team, but also we've empowered um, 
the, the staff across the agency who run IT organizations to be more effective. Uh, so the um, IT leaders that we have put in, that we have named across the agency are saying they're seeing things they never saw before because they have visibility and that allows them to make better decisions in their organizations. And so rather than us holding all that power in our central IT organization, we've spread that out with expectations as to how we work together and it's been incredibly successful in, in empowering everybody. Well, I bet it also provides a great dialogue to express the value that you're creating in a larger sense. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, one of the other topics that we hear about is the, the sort of uh, the race towards lowest cost mm -hmm. solutions and it makes sense on commodity IT but in many cases other kinds of projects get dragged down into mm -hmm. that and we get into the cost versus value debate. So tell us about um, how, how do you try, uh, in particular around cybersecurity, uh, how do you try to achieve the right balance between the low cost solution and the right value approach? Right. I think the, the most important thing when you go out to buy in a government context which is going to try and drive your lowest cost is to understand, as you said, is this a commodity where it doesn't matter? or is this something where it does matter? And when it does matter, we want to be very, very clear about our requirements so that we can say, these are our, our absolute necessary requirements and then we can, then we can choose a solution uh, that meets those requirements. So as long as you get the lowest cost that meets that set of requirements, you're meeting your needs. Right? And you need to make sure that you hold your vendor accountable, accountable for delivering on those needs and that they, that they have the features they said they had, that they implement things the way they said mm -hmm. they would, and that you get the result you're expecting. Mm -hmm. And um, lastly, uh, I want to talk about open source. And uh, I think the EPA's done an interesting job, actually, mm -hmm. in uh, opening up a lot of data sets and so forth. Tell us a little about um, what you're working on and shared mm -hmm. services and APIs and, and how are they playing a, a kind of a larger role in government from your perspective? So, so shared services are, are key in terms of our modernization effort. We have a number of shared services we already had in place for mission systems, and we're continuing to grow that base of shared services to provide those uh, capabilities across the agency. So we have things like a facility registry system, a substance registry mm -hmm. system, um, non-repudiatable non authentication solution. Thing, all those things that we need to help people gather regulatory data and that they can use those as shared services across the agency. And then we also, as you know, provide some shared services across the government as well that are not these you know, small components but actual uh, capabilities that are provided to other agencies like FOIA online and regs.gov. Mm -hmm. But leveraging all of those shared services are incredibly important to all the agencies in terms of getting more efficient and more effective. And we want to share even our registries and services internally, we're happy to share with other agencies because those just make those tools stronger. And since you work with states and other mm -hmm. kinds of uh, external agencies, are you finding that sort of open government, open data approach is, um, is kind of filtering through the ecosystem and is that coming back to help you? So, you know, it's a mixed bag through the ecosystem. We have states and tribes that are very interested in open data and engaged in that process with us. And as you point out, we've got a lot of open data. EPA has more data sets on data.gov, I think, than any other agency right now. Mm. Um, so we're very uh, transparent about our data. We're also transparent about a lot of our actual code as well. And so that sharing of data and sharing of code um, works really well with some entities, with some states and some tribes. Others uh, still feel that they need to hold that data really mm -hmm. close to the vest. Um, and part of that is, is about regulations. Who's regulating this industry? Um, is it the EPA, is it the state? And who has the first chance to deal with issues, right? States, in many cases, would like to have the first opportunity to deal with an issue, so they're a little cautious about opening up that data until they've had the opportunity to resolve an issue. Well, that's probably a good example of why the open data movement continues to sort of move in fits and starts, but um, appreciate your sharing that. Uh, and Duncan, thank you so much for joining us today, and uh, we thank our audience as well for joining us on FedScoop TV. I'm Wyatt Cash, and look for more of our episodes on FedScoop.com.